very honored for the invitation and very happy to be with you here this afternoon. We're here because of a hot topic in the news, an issue that has concerned many in rural Alberta for decades, uh, but it's something that's boiling over at the moment. Uh, farmers are calling for sabotage. Rural, far rural politicians are uh, in revolt uh, against the province. And so I want to say a little bit about this moment and how we got here, but so you don't all leave here depressed, I want to spend the, the last part talking about what we can do about it. Uh, because we can't leave it in the hands of our politicians and regulators. Uh, that's how we got to this point. And, but there are things that can be done, uh, and we're, we've been working really hard to understand this problem and try to figure out uh, what it is we can do, because we all live here, uh, and uh, we have nowhere else to go. And so we're going to have to deal with this uh, whether we like it or not. <clears throat> and so one of the groups that I'm a part of is the Alberta Liabilities Disclosure Project. It's a coalition of environmental groups, former regulators, industry veterans, landowners, and academics. And what we did last year is we got a whole bunch of data from the regulator through Freedom of Information, where they'd done an internal study of this problem. And the results of their internal study is vastly different than what they tell the public. What the regulator says in private is that we have a quarter trillion dollars in energy sector cleanup in Alberta. And the most important, there's a whole bunch of numbers on here. We had a workshop in Lethbridge with landowners and we went through all the different liabilities, all the different costs that aren't accounted for in our broken energy system. And this is a list of some of them. But the important one is that 2.7%, that we have a quarter trillion dollars in cleanup that needs to get done, but we're only holding a tiny fraction of that as security. There's no money in the bank to pay for this stuff. And so it makes it more complicated and tricky, uh, <clears throat> and it's also what makes it so urgent that we deal with this problem. And so today there's a crisis. Um, the industry isn't paying landowners, farmers aren't getting paid uh, for the energy activity on their land, and there's a tax strike. The oil and gas industry outside of the oil sands is in such tough shape these days, they're not paying their taxes. And Kenny goes on TV and tells you you can't get blood from a stone, that these companies are bankrupt, and that's true. There are some companies that are failing. There's $173 million in unpaid taxes from the oil patch, and the majority of it, more than $100 million, comes from oil and gas companies that are still operating. They just choose not to pay their taxes because they know local officials can't do anything about it. So it's a major problem. Uh, landowners not getting paid, now municipalities aren't, aren't getting paid, and that's a hint. That's a reflection of just how difficult the oil and gas industry is in Alberta these days outside of the oil sands. <clears throat> and in the media, orphans, that's kind of the shorthand. Everyone talks about orphan wells, uh, and that's kind of what frames this. Orphans are a minuscule fraction of this problem. Today in Alberta, there's 300,000 oil and gas wells that need to be cleaned up either today or in the near future. There's 3,000, 5,000 orphans. It's a rounding error. It gets a lot of attention, uh, but it's not the root of the problem. Orphans are just the tip of the iceberg. There's hundreds of billions of dollars more in unfunded cleanup that lies below the surface. And as Albertans, that's, that, that's what we should be uh, the most concerned about. <clears throat> this is a slide from uh, the Orphan Well Association recently made. And it shows how many orphans uh, there's been in recent years, and that number has been growing dramatically. Uh, and it also has the amount of money that's been spent uh, as a tiny fraction of it. It's, uh, they are spending more money than they used to. That's perfectly true, but it's wildly inadequate for the scale of the problem. There's more and more orphans coming. There's, uh, uh, and once again, there isn't any money set aside for it. The industry doesn't have a bank account set aside somewhere to pay for all this stuff at the end of their life. They only intend to pay for the cleanup out of ongoing profits. And if there isn't ongoing profits, it's going to be really tough to get cleanup money out of them. Uh, and so that's kind of the root of the problem. And the work I've done on the oil and gas industry for the last 15 years, a lot of it has been around royalties and profits in Alberta. And I've done this work, this is some of the peer-reviewed work I did for the Parkland Institute when I was there, calculating the profits generated in Alberta. <clears throat> a lot of money has been made from oil and gas in Alberta. And the owners, Albertans, have gotten a pretty small share of that. We have some of the lowest royalties on earth. Uh, we're getting two or three cents of every oil and gas dollar that comes out of the ground. And we own it. Uh, <clears throat> and the reason that I focus on this issue of uh, cleanup is because of this graph. 
because the oil and gas industry has, a, has had a wild ride. They've made hundreds of billions of dollars in profit, but that profit ended a decade ago outside of the oil sands. The oil sands, we produce three million barrels a day. They're insanely profitable. But everything out, outside of that, it's a 100-year-old uh, basin. It's been drilled extensively, uh, and it's just simply in its twilight. There's no longer, as a whole, profitable activity. And <clears throat> so the industry hasn't been turned to profit in a decade. That's, what makes, that's why I focus all of my attention on this issue. This is what makes it urgent. It's a big problem, uh, but this is why it's urgent because the industry is having the, it's the sun set on it. It's not going to be around for long. They are responsible for all this cleanup, but it's going to be up to us to figure out how we're going to hold them accountable. Because if the polluter doesn't pay, taxpayers will. There's no two ways about it. The industry understands it well. It's time for taxpayers to understand that and start acting accordingly. And so before I get to the AR, I just want to give you a quick sketch of how we got to this point. I think, I think the biggest news of the last six months was back in October when uh, the Public Interest Commissioner and the Ethics Commissioner and the Auditor General of Alberta all put out reports having studied the Alberta Energy Regulator. It's a pretty amazing thing that we had any serious body investigating the regulator, let alone two commissioners, each producing a 50, 60 page report and the Auditor General. So on October 4th in Edmonton, they had a press conference and there were three reports about the AER and they were absolutely damning. And they said that the regulator doesn't follow the law, that they don't follow their own policy, that they lack proper board oversight, and that the regulator operates in a culture of fear. <clears throat> These are the high, some of the highest bodies in Alberta. And when they tell us that that's how our energy regulator works, we should take it very seriously. And that's how we should be, that's how we should move from this point forward, understanding how broken that system is. And when it comes to the <clears throat> issue of oil and gas liabilities, it's not something that the industry wants to face, but it is something the regulators have tried to tackle over the years. We've had public servants in the energy regulator for a long time trying to tackle this issue, starting back in the 80s. And when this issue first came up in the late 80s, it's not complicated. They knew perfectly well how to solve it. Uh, but industry's pushback was, has been successful over the last 30 years in preventing any sort of sensible reform around this. So in 1991, that's the turning point in Alberta's industry. In 1991, accounting rules changed and you had to put cleanup on your balance sheet. You had to put something on the liability side for all the cleanup. You never had to do that before. And that was the same year that the court said, you have to clean everything up, even if you're bankrupt, the cleanup comes before the banks, you can't escape it. <clears throat> that turns 75 years of oil and gas development in Alberta on its head. Everyone had already carried on. You didn't care, care too much about the mess. The focus was on making money, but now you had to finally start cleaning up. It led to dramatic changes in Alberta. <clears throat> the regulator didn't enforce the rules, but the banks did. And the banks wouldn't lend money to anyone who was going to have a potential environmental problem. They do uh, audits, inspections, they have signed personal guarantees. And for 18 months in Alberta, uh, things changed. The whole focus of the industry shifted dramatically to cleanup. After 75 years, they were shutting down the Leduc field. Everyone's focus changed to cleanup. But that stopped literally the moment Ralph Klein became the premier. <clears throat> because when Ralph Klein was the environment minister, he cut a secret deal with industry. When the, the case from 1991 was in the courts, he cut a deal with industry. He said, as long as you guys can give your old wells to someone else, we promise never to look backwards. As long as you can sell it to a sucker, we'll never look backwards. <clears throat> and it's, not, it's not an official law, uh, but <clears throat> I have, there's enough in the documentary record to demonstrate that's exactly what happened. And that's what industry has been carrying on for the last 30 years. Uh, <clears throat> big companies drill a well, drill most of the profit, but while it's still attractive to someone else, they sell it off. And it's always been possible in Alberta to buy a thousand wells for a dollar, garbage wells. You pass it off to the next guy. And if he doesn't have enough money to clean up a thousand wells, uh, then it goes to the Orphan Well Association. That's the root of the problem. We've allowed them to pass it along, pass it along. They recognized this in 1992. They said, they recognized immediately industry is just passing off their garbage to other companies, but they've never done anything to stop it until today. You're still able to sell a thousand wells for a dollar to some mom and pop startup. And if he hurts someone or does something or something leaks, he's just one guy that doesn't have the resources to be held accountable for it. And so 
There's been a number of, of uh, efforts throughout the 90s. Uh, they've been thwarted by industry repeatedly. We had a program in the 90s to clean up the oldest of the wells. Industry had it cancelled. We had new legislation and a new regulatory program around 2000, and we legislated. You know, if a well is depleted, you can't, you can't transfer it to anyone else. It's yours. If you drained it, it's staying on your books, and you're going to have to clean it up one day. Industry had that, had that removed within months. <clears throat> and in the meantime, we drilled another 250,000 wells, uh, and we're still playing this game. And it's come to the crisis of this point. We have the commissioners and the auditor general telling us about just how poorly the energy regulator is operating. And so I want to talk a little bit about how the regulator works because I don't think it's very well understood. And I'll have Mark will help me uh, present some of the details. But it's important to understand if we're going to find ways to fix this broken system, first we're going to have to understand it and then recognize the tools and opportunities in the existing system that we can use to start making progress on this issue. <clears throat> There's, and there's, a, there's a variety of simple solutions that we can implement. And so this is, this is kind of where this talk came out of, this news about Jim Ellis, the CEO of the energy regulator. Now the details of his shenanigans aren't, aren't super important, but it's illustrative. It's illustrative of the culture. This is the CEO, the founding CEO. This is the, guy, this is the number two guy in charge. When they created the Alberta Energy Regulator in 2013, number one on the totem pole, was the founding president of the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. He was our new regulator's number one guy. And Jim Ellis was the number two. He was the straight man, a former bureaucrat. He's played some pretty nefarious roles in his history um, <coughs> leading up to this point, and he demonstrated his character uh, while he was at the helm of the AAR with the shenanigans he pulled there. Uh, and I'll, I'm going to invite uh, Mark Doran up to uh, go through a couple of these slides about the energy regulator. and. Uh, Mark? I represent a lot of landowners. I, was, I also worked in the oil and gas industry for about 40 years, so I know what to safe oil and gas is, and et cetera, and I deal with, or try to deal with the Alberta Energy Radio on a daily basis. That's almost impossible for landowners. The first thing you have to know is that the Alberta Energy Regulator has a mandate, and on the left is what they say all the time. So it's, it's, to, it's essentially to oversee the Energy Regulator from start to finish of an energy project, uh, uh, you know, and it, this includes uh, use and disposition of public lands. If you want to use the surface of public lands, the Alberta Energy Regulators, like the landowner, they actually negotiate the compensation on our behalf. That's all new. Uh, they're supposed to protect the environment and and deal with water use and water management. The problem is, is that they are supposed to also use their powers. And this is under Section 2 of the Responsible Energy Development Act. That's the, the, that's the AAR's, uh, what they call the enabling statute. That's what grants them their powers and limits their powers. So they don't rarely use, make use of their powers. There's all manner of enforcement issues that landowners require and the public requires for public safety, air quality, uh, water use, etc. They never take their gun out of the holster. It's, it's pretty rare to get enforcement at the AR. So it's, the significant problem is just, there's no, we, we have these incredibly fantastic energy laws in Alberta, the best in the world by far, and we're ignoring 99% of them. So this is a bit on structure. I'm going to be really quick here. On the left side here is the, this is really key that the Alberta Energy Regulator structured much differently than the former regulator was. So they have an operations branch and then they have a quasi-judicial branch. So think of the AR as a court, a police force, an administrative body, etc., all wrapped in one. And they have to keep these functions separate. The basics of dem democracy are separation of the administ administrative branches of government and the judicial branches of government. They're not doing it. So what they do is they, they, they concentrate on issuing licenses and permits, so oil well licenses and stuff. But what these really are, they're privileges. They're revocable privileges. And, and any time there's a revocable privilege, there's a corresponding remedy. So landowners, there's a remedy to every problem the taxpayer and landowner faces today. 
Most of them come from the Alberta Energy Regulator, and I'll come to that in a minute. We just can't get them. So they also issue, uh, the, uh, they also issue reclamation certificates, and a reclamation certificate is a government guarantee that the operator on the land has restored it back to its original capacity when the energy activity is finished. So it's really a guarantee from the taxpayer to the landowner that if, this, if anything surfaces later, the taxpayer is going to pay for it. I assure you these are just issued most of the time just like the toy out of a Cracker Jack box when we were kids. So uh, just, we don't have much time, so I'm just going to move ahead. And so this is essentially, uh, industry has full access. They have what they call routine and non-routine approvals for well licenses, pipe licenses, other licenses. Uh, routine means the computer issues it within about five seconds. I was in the appeal court yesterday all day in Edmonton about matters of jurisdiction. Do you have the power to do something? There's not a computer in the world that has a, has a decision-making power to make a decision in the public interest. Every well license, every pipeline license is different. Computers can't possibly. Any decision made by a computer is void. It's not enforceable on anyone. This is a huge problem. Here's really the problem we have as landowners and taxpayers. That's us on the left. We all have problems. They don't make their decisions transparently. There's about 40 to 60,000 well licenses and other decisions made by the Alberta Energy Regulator each year. We ask for hearings. We ask for uh, our participatory rights, which are inherent in land ownership. If they're doing an activity on your land that affects your right, whether it be a land right, a safety right, whatever, you have the right to put on evidence, question them, etc. The door is closed. They conduct three to five hearings a year. So, okay? So uh, it's, it's essentially obstruction of justice. So I'll let Reagan come back up uh, and take it from there. Oh, I just wanted to say, really quickly, the AR has many decisions. Their, imp their decisions impact other bodies like the Surface Rights Board. Once a well license is issued, they can force their way onto our land. We can't stop them. And so the result of the broken energy regulation system is that energy developers can effectively grant, grab the land of Albertans without properly compensating, without properly ensuring their safety uh, because the rules aren't being followed and when the door is locked uh, to remedies, um, we get a situation like we have today where it's boiled over and people are at the end of the ropes and have lost all confidence in the regulator. And this kind of uh, illustrates the problem. Industry has every intention, to give you a sense, there isn't a single oil company anywhere, no matter how nice they might be, there isn't a single en energy company anywhere that has any plan to clean up their mess. If no money set aside, nobody has a plan to clean up their mess. It's all going to be done one day. And what that means at the end of the day is they intend on uh, filling their pockets as much as they can and then walking away. And that's going to lead, that's going to dump these liabilities on the taxpayer because if the polluter doesn't pay, the taxpayer will. Uh, landowners have additional rights uh, that can protect them. And at the end of the day, that's the key, is those, those rights of the landowner are what can help us uh, when the regulator and the government won't. <clears throat> so there's, there's an enormous wave of liabilities coming. When I, when I mentioned that there's 300,000 oil and gas wells in Alberta, 250,000 of them are already, already inactive or produce less than 10 barrels a day. So they, they're on their last legs. They couldn't possibly fund their own cleanup. Five out of six wells in Alberta, out of the, outside the oil sands, need to be cleaned up today. Uh, and uh, when the industry isn't profitable, um, this problem that has been growing for decades is coming to a head. When companies can't pay their taxes, when they can't afford to pay a farmer a couple thousand dollars a year, that's a strong hint that there's something severely wrong. Uh, no one wants to face it. It's unfortunate that our flagship industry is so mature, uh, but we need to face the facts if we're going to avoid the worst consequences of this. And this is kind of the root of it. When Mark talked about us having wonderful energy laws in Alberta, that's our safety net. That's what protects us in, in all this development. The problem is the, the energy regulator who operates contrary to law, contrary to their policy and without proper board oversight, they're tearing a rip in, in that safety net, uh, that it's, it's not there to help us. And it's because of the regulator's policy that they set contrary to law is what 
tears a hole in this uh, safety net that uh, legislators have so thoughtfully uh, built up for us over these last decades. <coughs> And so there's, there's all sorts of Albertans that are deeply affected by this, uh, these, these growing issues that there's no easy, quick solution to have festered so long. Um, we're coming to a tipping point. Um, orphan wells uh, cause innumerable problems for farmers and ranchers who are no longer getting paid. There's nobody keeping an eye on them to make them safe, and there's no one cleaning them up affecting land values, affecting your ability to mortgage a piece of land, affecting your ability to, uh, to sell it, uh, and that problem is growing rapidly. Uh, and um, legacy wells, especially in urban areas, uh, can cause severe problems, uh, more acute safety and health uh, <coughs> risks uh, that close to the population, uh, and once again, they're, they're not being monitored, uh, they're not being cleaned up. And at the end of the day, this regulatory failure means uh, that uh, if we don't hold them accountable, it's going to come back to us. And so ultimately, at the end of the day, it's taxpayers who should be severely worried about this issue and urgently asking uh, their politicians uh, what they're going to do about it. And what we're going to do about it, what Mark and I and uh, the group of affected landowners and experts that we've been working with together, what we're uh, working on creating in the very near future is a group, a lobby, that can push back against the industry that has had its way in Alberta uh, for so many decades. The industry spends $50 million a year lobbying, getting their way, have for a very long time. Uh, and we suffer the consequences when the rule of law is undermined. And so the Pluter Pays Federation is the group that we're launching next week in Warburg, Alberta. And it's uh, another coalition of uh, municipalities and landowners and citizens. Um, they're going to do research around this issue, public education, and uh, legal support to help landowners and municipalities fight key cases that can benefit everyone. Uh, the way it is today, landowners are left on their own to fight against the world's richest and most powerful industry. Uh, incredibly complex regulations. Uh, no one can do it on their own. Uh, we need to start collaborating and combining our efforts strategically, and uh, the Pluter Pays Federation is hoping to do that. The best part about it, the Pluter Pays Federation will be paid for by polluters. Landowners can't say yes or no to energy development. It comes whether you like it or not. So in return for that, you're due to be compensated. You don't make a profit, but whatever, however you're inconvenienced, you're entitled to compensation. Uh, and membership in a group like the Polluter Pays Federation is a legitimate cost that can be passed along to the oil and gas operator on your land. So uh, whatever the membership fee is for the Polluter Pay that can help us do this work, uh, landowners can send the bill straight to the oil company. And instead of the oil company's check next year being $3,000, it'll be $3,000 plus the Federation membership. Uh, this isn't a stretch. This is established law. There's plenty of precedents. Membership in this sort of organization is uh, payable by the oil and gas companies. And so that means that we're going to be able to build uh, the education and uh, the research and the legal strategies on the company's dime, as it should be. And uh, there's an enormous opportunity. There's so much work to be done. Uh, we have quite an amazing array of experts uh, that have been working on this issue, trying to find those solutions. And um, maybe in the, in the questions and answers, we can get into some of the more details. But there's big opportunities for um, properly done. The landowners can force this sort of cleanup. Uh, waiting until companies are broke and bankrupt and then trying to look for money is a fool's game. We need to turn our focus on the companies that are still operating refusing to pay their taxes, refusing to pay landowners, and we need to force them to do cleanup uh, because every day they operate, uh, they're putting money in their pockets, and there's not a, lot, not a lot of money left in the ground outside of the oil sands. We need as much of that money as possible to go towards the cleanup. If uh, the polluter is going to pay, we're running out of time. And so um, that's going to be the, the goal of the Federation. Uh, to work with municipalities and surface rights groups uh, to try to utilize all these legal remedies that have been sitting uh, and haven't been utilized. Those are the opportunities we have to help fix this broken regulatory system. And so I'm, I'm sure I've raised all, I'm sure you guys all have all sorts of questions um, that we'll, we'll get into after lunch. Um, but. Next week is when is going to be the official launch of the Pluter Pays Federation. 
Uh, it's going to be broadcast on Facebook, and we're, Mark and I are going to be presenting to landowners in Warburg, uh, an impressive group that has been meeting on a regular basis since 1978 of landowners affected by pretty intense oil and gas development in that part of Alberta. And we're going to be laying out uh, how the Polluter Pays Federation is going to work, what it can do, how you can get involved, how we're going to pay for it, how it's going to be organized, and uh, start putting together a steering committee, launching the board, and um, making it a reality as soon as possible. Because uh, when it comes to this cleanup, the sooner the better. Every dollar we can force industry to pay uh, for cleanup is a dollar they can't loot and put in their pockets. Uh, this is a big issue, it's an urgent issue, but there's solutions. At the end of the day, cleanup means full employment in the energy sector. There's 300,000 wells to clean up. I mean, if every rigger can go back to work rigging tomorrow, cleaning up old wells, but only if we hold the polluter accountable, only if we make the polluter pay. Uh, if we do, there's a bright future ahead for Alberta. A quarter trillion dollars in cleanup, that means a quarter trillion dollars in economic activity in every corner of the province. No retraining, no relocation, there's no capital expenses, it all goes to wages. The cleanup is, couldn't be a bright future, but we need the political courage to hold the polluter accountable. And so um, we're hoping to uh, be able to help Albertans get involved and help make that a reality. Thank you.